We have just come off a whole lesson, a whole series of lessons about valence bond theory. Now valence bond theory is one way of looking at bonding. To kind of recap what it is, you have atomic orbitals within an atom and they mathematically mix to form what we call hybrid orbitals. And that is a really good theory for bonding and it works very, very well for organic chemistry and for those of you who are going on to organic, it'll work really well. But it's not the end, it's not the only way of looking at bonding. Another way to look at bonding is through molecular orbital theory. And just to give you a feel for how it's different, we do have mixing again, but we're going to take atomic orbitals on adjacent atoms and we're going to mix them together to make molecular orbitals and not these hybrid orbitals. So this lesson is about introducing what molecular orbital theory is and we're going to look at that bonding across the first period. So that would be hydrogen and helium and how we have bonding or don't have bonding in those. So molecular orbital theory is about electron delocalization. Delocalization means it's over the whole entire molecule and not localized on one, one atom within it. And then all bonds just be overlapping of these orbitals. Okay, so why would we need a whole nother theory? Well, in the case of valence bond theory, we sometimes do not actually observe within the molecules the properties that would be predicted by that valence bond theory. So you can't have a theory and, and have it stop if it doesn't account for things that we observe. Okay, so it's just a different way of looking at bonding. It is just another way of coming in and saying how are these atomic orbitals interacting to form the molecule. So what is a molecular orbital? A molecular orbital is defined here. It results from the interactions of the atomic orbitals um, of the bonded atoms. What, what atoms are involved in that bond? And it's associated with the entire molecule rather than living on an individual atom like hybrid orbitals did. Those SPs, those SP3s, they lived on an entire atom and you might have hybrids on another atom and then we just overlap those bonds. What we have here is mixing between forming these new orbitals that are associated with the entire molecule. Now if they're associated with the entire molecule it can get very, very complex because we have these molecular orbitals that have multi-atoms involved, but we're going to simplify it in here by talking about it in terms of diatomic molecules and diatomic ions and helps keep it a little bit more manageable. Now this is a prime example of where valence bond theory falls apart. In valence bond theory we always start with the Lewis structure and we talk about the bonds being the overlapping of these atomic orbitals. When we look at that Lewis structure and when we think about it in terms of valence bond theory, it looks like every electron um, are in pairs, okay? So we see this paired up. We have bonding pairs, we have lone pairs sitting around this oxygen. And that is not what we observe within the molecule of O2. If everything were paired, there's a word for that, diamagnetic, remember? Diamagnetic is not what we observe when we look at this molecule, okay? It is actually paramagnetic. Paramagnetic means it's got orbitals with unpaired electrons in it, which can be attracted to a magnet. So you can actually take oxygen and you can liquefy it and you can pour it through a, um, a magnet, which we're going to see a picture of in just a minute, and it will be attracted to that ma magnet. Valence bond theory doesn't explain this, but as we will eventually see, not in this lesson, but our next lesson, that um, molecular orbital theory will help explain why you would have unpaired electrons and why it would be paramagnetic as we observe that it really is. So, whoops, back up to that picture. So, what we have here is a very cold, um, liquid oxygen being poured through the north and south poles of a magnet. And instead of pouring right on through there, we see that it is being attracted and maintained right there in that space. And the picture on the right shows unpaired electrons causing that to happen. The only way you get attraction to a magnet is to have unpaired electrons. So we know it happens, we just haven't seen the phenomenon of it happening in terms of our theory yet. Alright, so we're going to start by looking at the hydrogen molecule first. Alright, so H2. We are starting there because that would be the simplest 
molecule. Okay, we know that if we were to draw a Lewis structure, we would have two electrons being shared. Now, when we were doing valence bond theory, we said we had a 1s orbital overlapping with a 1s orbital, and that overlapping was the bond. That's how we looked at, looked at it with valence bond theory. So how do we do it differently in molecular orbital theory? Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to actually mathematically mix these, okay, which we did not do before. We're going to actually mathematically take the mathematical equation that represents that 1s orbital and the mathematical equation that represents this 1s orbital, and it's going to form two new orbitals that we call molecular orbitals. Now, did we do mathematical mixing in valence bond theory? Yes, we did, but not in a case like this. We did mathematical mixing when we had a, let's say, three atoms connected to a central atom, and we might have mixed an S and a couple P's on that central atom, and that would make an sp2 hybrid, but it's still an atomic orbital. What we're going to do is mathematically mix um, across two different atoms in this case, okay? These new orbitals, if you put two orbitals in, you're going to always get two orbitals out. That process is similar. But these new orbitals are called molecular orbitals because they're mixed across the entire molecule. Now, of these two, once you mathematically mix them, one is called a bonding orbital and one is called an anti-bonding orbital. The bonding orbital is kind of like taking two mathematical equations and adding them together, and the anti-bonding would be analogous to taking a, these two mathematical equations and subtracting them from each other. Um, but it is this mathematical operation that is taking place. What you need to know is not how they're mathematically mixed because these are very high order calculus equations. You just need to know that they are um, combined in a way and when you put two orbitals in you're always going to get one that has lower energy. That's what the next thing is going to, oh does it say that on that side? One um, is bonding and one is antibonding. I haven't told you about their energy yet. Okay, So here is the mixing. The top image is when you've got, or the uh, bottom one is the adding them together in a sense, okay? And we see this uh, molecular orbital, and I'll come over and kind of draw on the screen. This right here is the molecular orbital, okay? This is its name. It's called a sigma. And then that 1s subscript means it is being made by the mathematical um, mixing of those equations in a positive way. This is called a bonding orbital, okay? It helps form bonds. Now we're representing this right here, and let me back it back up, Boop. we're mixing here with the 1s, and I'm showing it as a minus, this is a destructive interference. Remember, these are um, waves, and they can add constructively or destructively, okay? But these are called the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. They're designated with this little star here that tells me that it is an anti-bonding, and it will have a gap. You'll have a gap between the two nuclei, and these deteriorate the bond. So what we want is uh, more here, more electrons in this, less electrons in this if we want a bond to occur. Okay, so we have these two that are mixed, two that come together, one is a bonding, one is an anti-bonding, one is the wave interference being, I mean the wave, um, yeah, interference being constructive, the other one is a wave interference being destructive. So the bonding ones, the one that where you have no gap between the nuclei, the one that is constructive interference, that is always lower in energy than the anti-bonding ones, which are higher in energy. So if we show that in an orbital diagram showing the energies, that's what's on the next screen. Over on the left and right, the far left and right, are the atoms individually. But when they're mathematical orbitals, mathematical equations for those orbitals are mixed constructively. We get the sigma 1s, that's the lower energy one, and we get the sigma 1s star, that is the anti-bonding one. These two orbitals out here no longer exist, okay? So once they, the atoms get together, these orbitals no longer exist, and these are what we have. Two orbitals went in, two orbitals came out, bonding and anti-bonding. So this describes what is happening with 
a molecule of hydrogen. And if we were to do the molecular orbital diagram of this, we would call it sigma 1s, that's the name of the orbital, and it has two electrons in it. In a very similar way that we would use 1s1, 1s2 when we were talking about electron configurations of atoms. Okay, so you Fill those electrons in using the Aufbau principle, lowest energy up to the highest energy. We knew that we had one electron in each hydrogen. We took those two electrons, we put them where we could put them, and that would be the lowest energy orbital, the sigma 1s. And the sigma 1s star sits empty. We see that the same rules that we had before of Hund's rule apply. We want to um, uh, okay, can, and the Pauli exclusion principle applies. We can put more, no more than two electrons in any molecular orbital, and they have to spin in opposite directions. We'll put them from lowest energy to highest energy. That's the Aufbau principle. And, um, well, we don't have a case where we have multiple orbitals that are the same energy where we would half fill before we completely fill, but we will eventually see that, just not in this lesson. Okay, so once you've drawn the molecular orbital diagram, and you've established where those electrons are, and the MO electron configuration, molecular orbital electron configuration of this molecule would be sigma 1s with two electrons in it. Once you've established that from that diagram we saw, and we see it right here, we can then define how many bonds are between the hydrogen atoms. That's the bond order. Remember, a single bond is a bond order of one, a double bond is a bond order of two, and we can have bond and a half, and that would be a bond order of one and a half. Now, when we do molecular orbital theory, we don't have a picture to look at to count bonds. What we have to do is calculate it based upon the molecular orbital electron configuration, or the orbital diagram as we see here. The equation is seen there on the screen. If you want to know the bond order, you have to add up the number of electrons that are in bonding orbitals and subtract from that the number of electrons that are in anti-bonding orbitals and then divide by two and that will give you the bond order. So we'll do an example here with this one. We have got two electrons right here in the bonding, so this would be the number two. We have no electrons here in the anti-bonding, so that would be a zero. So two minus zero divided by two, this would give me a bond order of one. And so we have a single bond between there, okay? We just calculated the bond order of hydrogen. Whoops, let me back it up. Okay, so now we go back to how does this match up with valence bond theory. When we drew a Lewis structure, okay, which we have right here, we do that it was a single bond. We talked about, once we knew it from valence bond theory, how that bond formed. It's the overlap of 1s orbitals. But for us, now for this um, structure here, we know that it's 2 minus 0 over 2 also shows that it has a single bond between the hydrogen atoms. It has a bond order equal to 1. So both valence bond theory, which is driven from the Lewis structure, and molecular orbital theory are going to give you the same bonding. It's a single bond. Okay, so now let's do the bond order of helium. I'm going to get you started, then I'll let you uh, put in an answer. How would we do this? Well, we start thinking about, um, and we, you know, you're like, this is crazy. I don't know that doesn't exist. Helium doesn't bond with anything. But let's see how molecular orbital theory says it doesn't exist. What I would do if I were um, starting from scratch, and it's already built there, is I would know that the helium, which has an electron configuration of 1s2, has two electrons in that 1s orbital. Each helium has that, okay? I know the 1s is always mixed in the same way. We have a sigma 1s, and higher in energy is the antibonding, sigma 1s star. I know that each helium has two electrons, okay, so that's four electrons. I follow the rules. I start down here and I put my two electrons in, spinning in opposite directions, and I know that that orbital gets filled. And then I go here and put two electrons in and that orbital is filled. And that is what my molecular orbital diagram would look like if I wanted to write the electron configuration 
out this way, I would say it is 1s, sorry, sigma 1s, that's sigma 1s with two electrons, and sigma 1s star with two electrons. Usually we put parentheses around there because that's a lot to keep straight up, straight with, okay? So this is the name of the molecular orbital, how many electrons are in it. Name of the molecular orbital, it has two electrons. The name of the other molecular orbital, it has two electrons. Okay, with that information and how to determine bond order, calculate the bond order of He2. Well, it comes up with zero, doesn't it? It's two minus two over over 2, boy that doesn't look like a 2 to me, um, 2 minus 2 over 2, and so that is a bond order of 0. So molecular orbital theory tells me that no bond is going to form between helium molecule, or to helium atoms to form a diatomic helium molecule. Now you could do ions, okay? We could say, well what about there existing a helium 2 positive cation, all right? Well, we've never seen anything like that, but let's see if molecular orbital theory will allow for that. So I know that we have got four electrons, two for each helium, the positive charge means I subtract one, and I have three electrons to work with. I know we're in the first period, and in the first period it has sigma 1s and sigma 1s star. Those are my two molecular orbitals. I'm going to put the three electrons in. I put one, two, three. Three electrons in. That's the molecular orbital diagram. The electron configuration would look like this. Sigma 1s with two electrons. Sigma 1s with the star having one electron. Then we could do the bond order. The bond order is two minus one divided by two, and that is a bond order of one half. Now in terms of bond orders, okay, we can have a single bond, we can have no bond, we can have double bonds, but we can also have partial bonds, okay? So this isn't very strong, is it? It's a weak bond, half of a bond between those two is what molecular orbital theory would predict. So it'd be easier for this ion to exist. It could exist. It would not be possible for this in its ground state to exist. All right, so this is molecular orbital theory. This is molecular orbital theory for the first period across the hydrogen and the helium in which only the sigma 1s or the 1s orbitals are getting mathematically mixed to form that. So what we're going to do with our next lesson is go to the second period and start considering the orbitals that get mathematically mixed in the constructive and destructive interference to form our molecular orbitals.